Welcome to Philosophy Maths. Now this video is going to be slightly different. We're going to talk about chess and life and how to combine the two to get the most out of life and chess. Well, let's have a look at it. Welcome to Philotti Maths. Fighting problems one step at a time. Now, at some point in time, someone must have realised that it's better to try things out on the chessboard rather than losing a real battle. Now, you too can practise this on a personal level and chess will help you prepare for your personal battles as well as to plan, think and act more effectively. This is because chess teaches you to think before you act, manage your time more effectively, realize that every action has a consequence which is often irreversible, deal with the loss and keep fighting to the end, manage your emotions and hide them where appropriate, evaluate situations more effectively, improve your memory and focus, become more adaptable, cooperate in soft chess variants, and go all the way. It's not enough to take your opponent's pieces, you have to produce a checkmate, so you have to keep going all the way to the end. Now the first type of chess we're going to talk about is what we in everyday life call chess. Now this is only one type of chess variant, and it's primarily played in the Western world, so I can refer to it as Western chess. Now the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have a look at how the game is played and how the pieces move. If you already are familiar with the game, feel free to skip this part. Okay, so before we get started, we'll talk about the movement in the pieces of modern day chess. So firstly, we've got the pawns. The pawns can move one square at a time and they move forward but for the first move they can make a double move. Now the way pawns take a piece is diagonally. So for example if a pawn is facing a pawn it can't do anything about that but if there is a pawn and it's facing it diagonally then it can take that pawn during its turn. So that can happen on this in this direction or the opposite direction as well but only diagonally. There's also a very special move that a pawn can make and that is the so-called ampersand move and that is only when you've moved a pawn and then uh, your opponent has moved something else, you've moved a pawn again and now a pawn is making its first double move. So if a pawn makes its first double move and sits next to your pawn then you're allowed to do what's called an ampersand which is to take that pawn diagonally. Now this looks a bit strange but basically if you think about it to make the first double move the pawn is traveling through the line of attack that your pawn has and therefore your pawn had the opportunity to kill it or take it while it was on its way to get there. Thus you can take diagonally. Same in the opposite direction if a pawn makes its first double move and stands directly next to your pawn then what you can do is you can take that pawn diagonally like this now bear in mind that if a pawn makes its first double move next to you and you choose not to take for example you choose to make another move then your opponent makes another move now you're unable to take the pawn that you previously could take in the previous turn so it's only allowed as soon as the pawn stands right next to your pawn immediately after you can take. Okay, so let's have a quick look at how the other pieces move. So starting with the rook, the rook is worth roughly five pawns and basically can move straight uh, in any direction, any number of squares as long as its movement is unobstructed. So for example, it could move one, two, three, four squares in this direction or it could have moved, for example, three squares in this direction, or any number of squares, for example, one square or two squares in this direction, as long as you are not obstructed. What you could do is you could take an, an, a piece of the opponent just by moving and taking its place. Um, so this is pretty much how the rook moves. Now let's have a look at how uh, have a look at how the knight moves. So the knight moves in a so-called L shape and basically what that means is if the knight is right here there are eight squares that it can go to from this particular space. Uh, from this square which is white it can only go to the following squares. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
Notice they're all dark squares, and notice we can form a kind of L shape pattern, which is the way we like to remember it. And that is because we can easily see that this looks like an L letter, the shape of, an, of the letter L. So we can move in to any of those squares as long as they're not taken. So for example, in this case, we cannot move to this square because the pawn is right there. And similarly, we can't move to this square because there's already a pawn there. But we could potentially move to this square or we could potentially move to this square. So this is pretty much how the knight moves. Now let's have a look at the bishop. The bishop only moves diagonally. So therefore, if you've got a, a bishop which is sitting on a light square, it can only attack, it can only move to any square which is also a light square, and it's on the main diagonal that the bishop is sitting at the time. So for example, it could move here, it could move here, it could move here, or it could move here. Now notice it cannot move somewhere where you've already got a piece or a pawn, but it can definitely move to a square where your opponent has a piece thus taking that piece. So for example here, the bishop could take this pawn and that is absolutely fine, the bishop can move there. And this is pretty much how the bishop moves. Now let's have a quick look at the queen. The queen is technically the most powerful piece on the chessboard and practically can move like a rook and a bishop at the same time. Thus it can move straight in any direction as well as diagonally on the diagonal it is sitting. So let's have a look at that in this particular case. So if the queen is here on uh, the square e4, it could move in any direction and any number of squares on the files and columns where it's sitting, or it could also move diagonally. So for example, it could move here, it could move here, it could move here, it could move there. Now, we tend to say that the squares that the queen cannot go to around her are basically the squares that a knight would be able to go to. So from here, for example, the queen is uh, basically unable to go to the squares which a knight would be able to go to, but it's able to go to all of the other squares um, in close proximity other than the ones that the knight cannot go to. So this is pretty much how the queen moves. And finally, let's have a look at the king. Now, bearing in mind that the king is old and frail, he can only move one square at a time. So he can move to any square surrounding him. So for example, he could go to this square, or that square, or that square, or this square, basically any square around him which is unoccupied. Uh, now, the king could technically take any piece or pawn which is around him, as long as it obviously it's unsupported. To so say, for example, there's a pawn right here, the king could just take it uh, and take its place. And he could also do the same if there were a piece diagonally. Um, here he could just take that piece or same, he can go backwards. Uh, he can just move in any direction, one square at a time, taking pieces as long as they're unsupported. Now, there's one more move which is a bit of a special move that I have to mention here, and that is the so-called castling. Now, castling works as follows. You must have moved these pieces out of the way, and you must have ensured that the squares between your king and rook are unoccupied. Now, as long as these squares are unoccupied, and they're not being attacked by another piece, then you can make this so-called castling move, which involves your king moving two squares towards your rook, and your rook moving to the other side of your king. Now, this is a move that we make in order to ensure that the king is properly uh, put in, into safety before you can actually get involved into uh, an attack or battle with your opponent. Uh, so this is castling on the so-called king side. So this is the so-called king side castling it involves your king moving two squares towards your rook and your rook moving uh, to the other side of your king. Now we can do exactly the same thing on the other side, but this means that we must have moved the queen, the bishop and the knight out of the way. And if this has happened, basically you do exactly the same thing, but now it's, it's now called queen side castling. So you have to move your king two squares towards your rook and your rook moves to the other side of your king. Now notice in this case, your king is further away from the, the edge of the board, from the corner, and that 
means that this is slightly more risky as an approach. We tend to consider this as a more risky way to castle, but it does give a bit more of an edge when it comes to attacking. So it's considered more of an offensive type of castling. And this pretty much concludes our introduction to the movement of the pieces and how the game is played roughly. Okay, so another couple of rules we're going to briefly mention here are, firstly, when you touch a piece, you have to move it. So if I touch this piece, I've got no way to um, then say, oh, actually, sorry, I've changed my mind, I'm going to move this knight. That's actually not allowed in chess. So you touch a piece, you have to then move it. You can decide what kind of move you're going to make with it, but basically you have to move this particular piece. Uh, likewise, if I touch my opponent's piece, say my opponent moves here, if I touch my opponent's piece, indicating that I'm going to take it, then I am forced to take it. I have to take that that piece. So if I touch this and then I say, oh, actually, no, I'm going to take, I'm not going to take that. That's not allowed. You have to take that pawn. So as, in essence, you really have to think before you act in chess. Uh, and if you do act, then your actions will have consequences which might be irreversible. So you can't really take things back. You can't really say, I'm going to take this and then notice, oh, that's taken by the queen. Sorry, I'll take that back. I just realized that would be a bad move. You're not allowed to do that. You have to do it all in your head mentally before you actually move to the physical after you've decided. Uh, so that's definitely one thing that we had to mention. Now, finally, let's talk about the endings in chess. So we've got uh, the following options in chess. It will either end in a draw or it will end in victory for one of two players. Now we've got a couple of different types of draws. So one type of draw would involve, for example, um, say just a king being left on each side. So if we just have a king left of on the white army and just a black a king left from the black army then what happens is this is a draw because these two kings on the road they've got insufficient material to produce a checkmate uh, it would be the same for example if we had just a king and a knight left here and a king and a knight left on this side that's insufficient material to check to checkmate the opponent and that means this would be a draw if this is all that's left on the chessboard so this is what we call a draw, but then there's another type of draw uh, which we call a stalemate. And that is when, for example, uh, let's say that uh, the, the king is right here. And let's say that this side is all gone. There's nothing left. It's only a king. And now I, I come along with my queen and let's say that my queen is right here and i've also got this pawn here now if it's black's turn to move now then let's see what black's options are black can already go here or here or here or here because these squares are all being attacked or protected by the queen and also the king cannot go here because this square is being attacked by this pawn. So technically, really, this king has nowhere to go. But at the same time, this king is not really being attacked. Therefore, this is really a draw, a special type of draw, which we call stalemate. So whenever you've got the upper hand in terms of material, you always have to pay close attention to make sure you don't allow your opponent to be in such a favorable position for them the so-called stalemate and you have to make sure that whenever you make a move you're actually um, letting your opponent go to a certain square or you're just attacking your opponent so instead of coming to this square for example the queen could have come to this square checking the king and then the king would have somewhere to go so eventually the the white player would be able to win this game by checkmating and finally checkmating which would lead to a uh, a victory would look something like this say that um, the white queen and the white rook are right here and now the queen is able to make a move and move to this square right here now the queen is being defended by the rook so the king cannot really take the queen and at the same time the queen is attacking the king and the king has nowhere to go because all the squares around him are also under attack by the queen now this is what we call a checkmate 
and it literally translates to the king is dead in old or ancient Persian. Now, this is not going to be a traditional instructional approach of chess. I'm not going to be explaining how the game is played, but what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be expressing my thoughts and feelings while I'm playing a random game of chess and basically I'm going to be walking you through what's going on in my mind and show you how things could be relevant how thoughts and processes you develop while you play chess could become relevant to your everyday life. Okay, so without further ado, let's have a quick go at a blitz game. Good luck. Okay, so one of the first things I do is I move something in the center to take better control of the center. Now my opponent is kind of mirroring what I'm doing and I'm gonna, what I like to do is play offensively and attack my opponent's pieces straight away luring them into a potential attack which would expose them. Now in this case I'm thinking if I take this pawn then my opponent's going to be forced to take back with uh, her pawn and then I'm going to take her queen which is going to expose her because she's going to have to take back with a king. Interesting. So now I'm thinking I've got the upper hand so I'm getting a little bit more confident with my playing. So I'm just going to take this pawn right here which is going to give my opponent the ability to develop her pieces but it definitely means that I've saved a bit of time because they acted swiftly and it also allowed me to just think about my next move so sometimes it will make moves just to gain a bit of time okay so my opponent is developing her pieces I'm going to do the same whilst placing my bishop in a square where it's pinning the knight to the king this is a well-known tactic in chess called pinning basically it means your opponent cannot move the piece because you're the king would be attacked directly. Okay, so my opponent took care of that straight away. I'm gonna go ahead and castle, which is a move we introduced in the beginning. Now, you should always aim to castle as quickly as possible because it puts your king in safety. Okay, so now my bishop is being attacked by that pawn, so I've got a choice. I'll either take this knight or move my pawn out of the way. In general, bishops are worth a bit more than knights, so I'm gonna keep my bishop by moving it back. I think it's gonna come in handy, this bishop, in this game. Okay, so it looks like my opponent's thinking about castling on that side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to prevent that by moving my bishop here. Because then that means that the king cannot go there. I'm trying to prevent my opponent from castling, basically, and be a little bit annoying. And it seems that I dropped a pawn. Basically, that pawn was undefended. So I'm going to move my rook here to attack the knight, which just took my pawn. And I'm thinking as soon as the knight moves out of the way, I've got a... A good line of attack between my rook and my opponent's king, which I'll, I'll make use of um, in a bit. Okay, so it looks like this bishop is now defending this knight. So let's see what I can do. So I'm gonna, I've just thought of a different option here, which is to put a bit more pressure on that knight. So let's see if I do it this way, which is not necessarily the best way. Let's see how my opponent's going to respond. I was considering placing my knight here, but that would mean that it is blocking my bishop, so I didn't like that move so much. In retrospect, it might be a better move though. So, my opponent took, and I will take back. Okay, it looks like my opponent might be thinking about castling on that side now, so I want to rush if possible to um, basically take advantage of my opponent's exposed position, currently exposed. Let's see if I can exploit it somehow. Um, looks like I can't really exploit it at the moment. Oh, no. Looks like I can't. Let's see. Okay. Okay, so what I'm going to do instead then is I'm going to attack my opponent's bishop and if my opponent chooses to exchange knights, what that's going to do is I will take back with my pawn, thus repairing my pawn structure, which is currently a little bit damaged here. So it is a bit of a rush. If my opponent chooses to castle, which is likely, then what I have gained here is a knight in a slightly better position than before. Okay, so let's see what we need to do. I need to activate activate my bishop, which is here, and it's not doing much. So I'm going to place it on this square, eyeing down on where my opponent's king is going to be in a few moves. And indeed, my, my opponent moves the king towards the corner where he's safer, and it seems like I'm running out of time, so I need to rush a bit more. So I'm going to move my queen 
connecting my books. This is what we call connecting the books when they've got no pieces uh, between them. Okay, it looks like my opponent's making a move on my king side, but I think I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna keep attacking on the left. So I'm gonna try to place my rooks one behind the other and create a powerful line of attack. Okay, my bishop's being attacked, I'm retreating. Okay, my queen's being attacked now, and I just noticed that this has been going on for a while. I can take this bishop because the bishop and the, the queen and the knight were attacking the bishop at the same time. So now basically I'm a piece up thanks to this move. Let's see how my opponent's gonna respond. I have to be conscious of time. So queen takes, I take back with the knight. Looks like I'm winning in terms of time. I'm going to move my book here. My opponent's going to take a pawn. That's absolutely fine by me. Uh, let's move the rook here. Okay, and I got lucky there because I almost dropped a, a rook which was being attacked by the, the bishop and I didn't see. And then I was careless enough not to see that I could take the bishop. So this is quite common when you're running out of time. In chess, you tend to make silly mistakes. So knight takes, I take back to the rook. We're running out of time, so we have to be careful how we go about it. Let's see. Okay, right. Okay. Now take check. Check. My opponent could ah. take there, but Thank you for that game, that was lovely. I uh, hope we got something good out of it and some good thought processes there. But uh, let's reflect on this. Basically, the more time you have, the more time you have to process things and you can think more clearly. I think in the beginning of this game, we were able to analyze a bit more clearly and see what was going on. But towards the end, as we realized we were running out of time, both myself and my opponent were moving in a, a bit of an erratic way and we, we kept missing uh, important things. So one aspect in chess is really how much time you have to invest. And this is quite common in life as well. When you have more time to think about a problem uh, which you have at hand, you tend to have more time to process things more clearly and come up with a better solution or result. When you're pressed with time, then there comes a different aspect where you have to act swiftly. So often you will make a decision which is a bit more mechanical and less of a, of a, of a move that you have thought of um, clearly and deeply. So that was Western chess. Let's move on to another variant and see how things play out there. Now the second type of chess variant we're going to talk about is the so-called circular chess or Byzantine chess. Now this is a type of chess that has been played from the 6th century AD up until today and it's been primarily played by Persians, Arabs and the Byzantines. Now what's special about this one is it's round, it's got a hole in the middle and it's played on two opposite fronts at the same time. Let's have a look at it. So basically, as you can see, the main difference here is that this is a circular board and thus this imposes a limitation to the way you fight. And this means that you fight on two fronts. So you can fight in this direction and this direction as well. Now, bearing in mind that the pieces move exactly the same way as they do in the previous chessboard we saw, uh, here we've got the main difference that, for example, the rook can actually move, travel all the way around the chessboard, which is quite an interesting notion. That is, if the pieces in front of it are missing, the rook can, for example, travel all the way around the chessboard. So this is one of the interesting facts about this chessboard. Now, another interesting fact, for example, is that here we don't have traditional methods of checkmating as we do in the other chessboard because there is no corner. Thus, you can be chasing your opponent's king all the way around the chessboard, but the king can always escape if you only have a rook, for example. But in any case, let's get into it without further ado. Just Quickly mentioning that these are pawns, so the pieces uh, on the first line 
are what we call pawns. Uh, this piece with the little thing that looks like a head on top is the knight, and it moves exactly the same way in an L shape. Now, this piece right here is the bishop, it moves diagonally, and this piece right here is the queen, so it moves like a regular queen. Um, now, just quickly mentioning that here we've got no castling. Okay, one more thing I'd like to mention here, we've got a special rule, if a pawn moves forward and another pawn moves forward and eventually they meet, now at any point as soon as somebody is starting their turn and they're making the first move, if they choose to do so they can remove these two pawns and then make a move. So yeah, once again, if you have two pawns facing each other, say for example I want to make a move, I can remove them and then make a move. Or I could choose to ignore the fact that they're facing each other and make another move, thus making it my opponent's decision whether she wants to remove the pawns and then make a move or make another move. So we can choose to make this move at any point in time as long as it's the first move we are making in our turn, during our turn. So let's get started then. I, again, I'm going to be describing what I think is going on with my opponent and what I'm processing, the way I'm seeing things and what I think is best for me to do considering that I will only have, once again, three minutes to do everything I do. Um, so, let's give it a go. Good luck. Good luck. Okay, so I'm thinking about... I'm thinking about what I'm going to do next on this side and I've got the option of clearing the board which I don't like so much so I'm gonna instead of removing the pawns here and attacking with a rook I'm gonna develop my knight and see what happens just adding to the complexity of the board okay so my opponent's moving that pawn there uh, I'm gonna move this pawn forward so I can clear a way for my bishop to attack Okay, that's interesting. I'm going to move on the other side now, just to com um, complicate things a little bit. Okay, so it looks like my opponent's making a move on this side of the board. Uh, let's see, so I think what's that done now is it's created a knight square for my knight to jump into. So I'm going to keep hold of that uh, square just in case I want to be able to attack with my knight and maybe combine it with an attack with some other pieces. Okay, looks like my opponent's moved on this side. I'm gonna ignore the fact that my opponent forgot to press the clock because it's basically times on my side in that case. Uh, okay, so <laughs> basically, let's see what we have to do here. It looks like most of the attack is taking place on this side, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring over another piece and try to come into the attack on this side. Okay, so it looks like that bishop wants to um, get rid of my knight, which is sitting in a nice square. Uh, what can we do about that? Let's see, perhaps support it further with that pawn. Okay, my pawn's taken. I'm gonna take back just to make sure I'm not down in material. Okay, right, interesting. So we've got an attack on this side but nothing too serious. It looks like most of the attack is taking place on this front right here. So how do we activate these rooks? Maybe if we attack on this side and open up the file where the rooks are sitting, maybe we can do something there. So let's see, we've got the option to just clear the way for the bishop to come into the attack. Okay, now it looks like my opponent now is getting ready to do something dangerous for me. So if my opponent chooses to remove these pawns, it might be a bit dangerous for me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do it myself. So I'm removing these two pawns and I'm starting my attack, which is moving with this rook and taking my opponent's rook. Okay, my opponent took back and then I can take with my rook. And it looks like at the moment, I'm a rook up. So I got lucky there, but I do have to keep in mind that I'm half a minute down in time and I also, it's not necessarily um, certain that I'm gonna win just because I've got Armabrook up in this game. Okay, it looks like I've managed to take a bishop which is not being defended because my opponent was thinking of the attack. So my opponent went into the offensive to attack my rook but completely forgot that the bishop here was um, being attacked by my rook and it was undefended. 
So it looks like I, I was quite fortunate here. Okay, so it looks like this knight is attacking my rook, so I have to be conscious of that. Uh, let's see, so I need to move the rook, and I'm just going to be a bit annoying, and I'm just going to move it here, pinning the knight to the queen. It means if the queen moves, uh, so if the bit if the knight moves, I'm going to attack the queen, take the queen. Just to save a bit of time, it's always good to think of an annoying move that your opponent might not like so much. Okay, now bearing in mind this chessboard has a bit of an awkward shape, it's not easy to see always that, for example, a knight here is attacking this queen. My opponent did well to hide the fact that she realised this was a mistake, but I still noticed. And also this happens to be a check, because the knight is attacking the king, so the king has moved. Okay, right, let's think about this now. So what can we do about this? Uh, let's bring this queen into the game and now oops and now the queen is defending or supporting the rook over there but I still am down in time so I have to be very careful with my next few moves not to spend too much time thinking about them okay so I'm going to move my queen into the action and I'm going to move oh where can I move I have to be very very careful right so I'm going to move to oh gosh it's dangerous and I'm running out of time. Think. Okay, I'm gonna move here. Okay, looks like I can take this bishop now. Okay, and looks like I can take this knight. Okay, and now it looks like my rook can come and pin the knight. I've only got seven seconds left, so I have to think and act fast. Check. And check. Mate, apologies, you can't make that move. That's an illegal move because my pawn is attacking that square. So it looks like I actually managed to win with two seconds left on the clock. <laughs> well, thanks for that. That was really good. <laughs> right, so as you can see here, it's an interesting game because firstly you are trying to play a game that you think you know but actually because the terrain is different there's a lot of optical illusions there and I think this is often something that happens in life you face a problem and it, it seems very familiar but suddenly because it's in a totally different context you might keep confusing yourself about what it is exactly that you want to do and how you're going to achieve it so trying different variations of what you already know can help you develop the skills that require required to adapt to a setting which is slightly different slightly different to what you're used to and that habit getting into the habit of adapting adapting to different situations and processing all of this uh, this different information really to react uh, swiftly and efficiently is going to benefit you um, in life overall. Okay, so this is pretty much it. Let's have a look at a different variant now. We're going to have a quick look at medieval chess. Now the third type of chess variant I'd like to talk about here is the so-called medieval chess. Now this is a type of chess that used to be played in the medieval times. And what's interesting about this one is that instead of being 8x8, it's 8x12. Thus, it includes more pieces that no longer exist today. So let's have a look at it. Okay, so this chessboard, as you can see, is instead of 8x8, in this case it's 8x12. Now this is a medieval chessboard, and this used to be played in Germany in medieval times. So most of the pieces are the same it's just that i'll have to mention a couple of differences so firstly we've got the rooks here which are exactly the same we've got the knights here which are exactly the same we've got the pawns which are all the same as our traditionally uh known pawns but now we've got these two bishops now bishops are different in this game and bishops only move two squares at a time so basically these two bishops cannot move when we, we start because they're being blocked by their own pieces so they're being blocked by their own pawns so as soon as the pawns move out of the way then these bishops would be able to make the first double move and technically they move two squares at a time so this is a relatively weak piece because often you'll find it blocks 
uh, your your own army and you're unable to make a move because this uh, piece is in the way. Uh, so let's have a look at the next piece, which is the messenger. And the messenger here moves exactly the same way as modern day bishops. So basically you can move any number of squares diagonally. So for example, if the, bishop, the messenger was here, uh, it, it would be able to move diagonally any number of squares. So these are the messengers. Uh, moving on towards the center, we've got, for example, this is the jester. So this is the uh, piece which moves only one square at a time, and it can only move forward, backwards, to the right, or to the left. So basically, it can only move one square at a time, but it moves in kind of this fashion. So this is the jester. Now moving on to the queen. The queen is a relatively weak piece, bearing in mind this is the medieval times. Perhaps it wasn't seen as a socially uh, powerful um, human being, if you like. And basically what the queen does in this uh, chess, chess version is it only moves one square at a time diagonally. And that's it. So basically the queen can move like this, one square at a time. Notice that the queen is basically trapped and can only move uh, in one specific color throughout the game. And then we've got the wise man. So the wise man is sitting by uh, the king's side and he can move exactly like the king. The only difference is basically this can be attacked. So although normally you can't place your king, you can't move your king to a square where it's being attacked, well, the wise man can move to a square where it's being attacked. And that's pretty much it. We've seen all the different types of pieces here. I'm going to mention quickly that there is no castling here. And also the starting position is a bit of a strange one. Instead of having all the pawns sitting back and waiting for the battle to begin. And the queen sitting by the king's side. We've got this strange uh, opening position where the pawns... These pawns are already two squares ahead. And we've got the central pawns in front of the queens have moved two squares forward and we've got the queens waiting right behind them. Uh, also, just a quick note, in this variant we've got the king uh, is on his colour and the queen is on the opposite colour. Okay, without further ado, let's get started and I'll be thinking out loud throughout this session. So, let's give it a go. Okay, so let me think. Uh, going to move my this square. Okay, releasing basically, making way for my messenger in case he wants to come into the action. Uh, let's see, let's just attack in the center. Okay, so I'm going to take back. Interesting, so we've got the queen. The queen would move here. So what I'm going to do instead of taking is I'm going to move my pawn forward because that restricts the movement of my opponent's queen. I wouldn't like my queen to be taking back and standing there. That would be too central a square. So let's think, I'm going to develop some pieces. This is a bit of a slower game here. Okay, so we've got that interesting piece there. So let's see what we can do about that. So I'm going to put my messenger here. And now what I'm thinking of is I'm eyeing down on this pawn right here. Okay, it looks like the knight is now in the way, so I can't really take that. So let's see what we can do. I'm going to move my knight forward attacking my opponent's queen but actually in this game it's quite interesting the knight is stronger than the queen so I wouldn't really take the queen uh, with my knight instead what I'm thinking of is I'm gonna take this pawn right here thus attacking my opponent's rook and my knight is being defended by my messenger so I can really afford to do that it's not like I'm going to lose my knight my opponent chose to take my knight that's absolutely um, fine I can take back with my messenger now the messenger are, is quite a powerful piece in this game in fact I think it might be even more powerful than the rook 
Okay, so it looks like my opponent might be thinking of trapping that messenger, but I'm not really concerned at the moment. It doesn't look like it can be trapped as such. So I'm going to develop another piece. Whoops. I have to start being a bit more conscious of time. man in the move. Okay, wise man on the move. We're going to move some of these pawns out of the way to make way for the other messenger and other pieces to come out and join the action. Okay, but it looks like this square is a good square for my knight, opening up some possibilities to attack on the king side. Sorry, this moves diagonally two squares at a time. Okay, and it looks like now this piece doesn't have many options because it can only move two squares at a time. It looks like my opponent doesn't really care much about that piece anyway. Um, I'm going to take it. Why not? I'm advancing my pawn. I've taken that piece, and if my opponent takes, I can take back with my queen. That's absolutely fine. Okay, so it looks like this pawn is now being attacked with two different pieces. So I don't want to take that. One piece. Oh, one piece. Yes, indeed. Sorry, thanks for that. So it's just the. It's just the pawn there, so it looks like I don't really have to take. I'm going to take this instead. It looks like my opponent's got less time than I do, so I can basically afford to pay a bit more attention to the details. Since my opponent's a bit more pressed, I can afford to take my time. Okay, it looks like I made a silly mistake, though. It looks like I didn't really think that through. Okay, so I'm going to bring my messenger into the action, checking my opponent's King. Okay, so let's see what we can do here. Uh, let's move the wise man. Okay, so I'm going to take attacking the knight. Okay, and then I can just move again attacking the knight. So it looks like in this chessboard the kings are too too exposed. Okay, so the knight is there. If I can move my pawn there, it looks like a very good move because it's forking the two pieces of my opponent, and I can take one of them definitely. Okay, right. Let's think now. So what if we move right here, just coming closer to the king, centralizing the the messengers a little bit. Um, now we can move this. Ah. Uh, bishop into the action. Okay, I can take now this knight because it wasn't being defended. Okay, that was a good move actually because this useless piece is standing in the way so I can just move it out of the way. Um, okay, it looks like the rook's being centralized so I'm going to move my wise man out of the way to bring a rook here into the action and attack the king. So check. I'm attacking your king so it's check. Time's over. Okay, so it looks like Time was up. Well, thank you. Good game. Okay, so as you can see here, it's quite complicated because you've got more pieces, so more decisions to make. Um, your king is more exposed, and there's a lot of things that you have to think about, like the... Sometimes you just... It might be worth sacrificing this piece like my opponent did. Sometimes it kind of comes into the way. In some cases, not really worth it. So sometimes sacrifice comes into uh, something you have to think about in this uh, chessboard. It might be worth it. Uh, also, we've got a different way of thinking about these messengers in this game. And the fact that the queen is worth less in this chessboard, often what you would think a good exchange is not really a good exchange in this variant. Um, but yeah, this is pretty much it when it comes to medieval chess. Um, I hope you enjoyed this brief introduction to it, and we will be moving on to a different, completely different type of chess next. Now, another type of chess variant I'd like to talk about here is the so-called SER chess, or SER chess. 
Now the name comes from three important scientists, namely Sir Pinsky, Einstein and Rosen. And what's interesting about this one is it's missing the centre. You have two queens per side and it includes teleportation squares, which adds a totally different dimension to the game. Let's have a look at it. So this uh, so-called Sir Chess, we've got um, a couple of structurally different things compared with the regular modern day chess. We've got obviously a hole in the centre of the chessboard, the centre is missing effectively. Uh, both sides we have two uh, queens rather than one. And also we've got these blue squares. Now these blue squares on the chessboard represent pathways or if you like bridges uh, effectively from one of these squares you can teleport as if you were moving in an L shape like a knight to another blue square so for example from this blue square you can move to this square or you can move to this square so therefore we've got this kind of L shape to get to any other blue square. So any blue square is basically connected to two other blue squares. For example, this one is connected in an L shape to this square and it's also connected to this square right here. Now a couple of rules about these blue squares. Firstly, the pawns cannot move through these squares. Uh, secondly, if you have for example moved and you have moved a piece in here, now this piece could attack this square and this square but it's not really attacking it as such because I have to decide whether I will be uh, moving to that square during my turn or not but something that definitely cannot happen is that my opponent for example cannot choose to move the king inside this blue square because that means that my opponent is putting is placing her king in jeopardy so that is not allowed but any other piece can definitely move there and then I could choose to take that piece. Okay, so this is pretty much it. Castling is the same. We can move the pieces out the way and castle normally, and everything else stays the same. So let's get started and see how we have to play when the center is missing and when we have the additional option of teleportation. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so in this game, I tend to start by moving my pawns um, that are in front of the blue teleportation square so I can then uh, move my bishops in there and put some pressure on my opponent's blue square here in the center. So let me think about it for a second. So it looks like I can actually attack here by moving my bishop there and forking my opponent's two queens. Okay, and then I'm going to take back. So it looks like my opponent uh, basically lost the queen for two bishops. Okay, now let's see what we are going to do next. Okay, so I'm going to move my knight here. Okay, my opponent castled. I'm going to move this knight there. Okay, right, let's move this pawn there. It's not going to make another move in this game. Okay, interesting. Now let's see if we can attack. Okay, so if I move in here now, now it looks like I'm attacking this square and this square. They're both being defended, but let's see. So if I take this bishop here, attacking my opponent's queen now. Okay, so I can move my knight in there and check my opponent. Okay, let's see, let's attack on the king side. And it looks like my opponent can choose to either come to this square or this square when teleporting. So let's see what my opponent's going to choose to do. Okay, interesting, interesting. So it looks like my opponent went there. I'm gonna take, because I wanna free up this square so I can move into that if I want to with another piece. Okay, right. I'm gonna keep, continue with the attack on this side, on the king's side. Okay. 
Right, that bishop now is attacking here and it's also doing something here. Okay, let's see. So if we move the king, the queen, sorry. If we move the queen to line it up with the rook, potentially that could be quite um, a good attack against the king. Okay, so attacking the knight now. So my opponent has to take back and now a take back attacking the knight. And my opponent has to be a little bit careful about her next move because I now have the rook and the queen and they are eyeing down on this pawn which is right next to the king. Okay, it looks like my opponent failed to see that she could easily have placed the knight here to defend that pawn, so now I can take that pawn with my sorry, that knight with my pawn. Okay. Okay, and then I'm gonna take this, just exposing my opponent's king a bit more. Okay. Right, that is interesting. Let's bring the queen into the action. Hmm, that was a good move because this move was coming next, attacking the queen. And if the king hadn't moved, the queen would be gone now. Okay, lovely. Let's see. Let's see. We'll bring the rook forward. And then we will also bring the queen down here to defend or support the rook. Okay, right. Let's bring this queen over to support the queen. So now we've got two queens eyeing down that pawn. Can I? Yes, absolutely, you can teleport there. So it looks like my opponent's just checked me. Okay, I'm just gonna move out of the way. Okay, that's interesting, that's very interesting. Let's see if we bring the king up here, just making sure that I've got the other rook, I've got way for the other rook to come into the action. It looks like we're running out of time. My opponent's got 20 seconds, I have 40. Okay, right, so I've got one, two, three. We've got one, two, three defending. So if I add another attacker, let's see what's going to happen then. Okay, so I'm going to take this ball now. Okay, right, so let's prevent my the king from moving out, from escaping effectively. Mm -hmm. Right, and now I'm gonna check my opponent's king. Can I? Yes. Now. Well, let's assume you had one more second left and I would check you and then you would probably lose on time here. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, very interesting game. I'm not really sure what would have happened in the end, but I do feel like I had the upper hand here and I was really um, chasing the uh, op opponent's king. Uh, however, the king, for example, could have suddenly escaped to this square right here. And it might have been really tricky for me to just divert, redivert all of this energy into a new attack coming over to this side. So basically, this kind of chess makes you think very, very differently because normally in traditional chess, you have to think about the center and how you develop your attack that way. But in this chess, things are quite different and checkmate doesn't necessarily work the same way as it does in normal chess. For example, you, your opponent king could run around the center and if you only had a rook to chase him you would chase him forever thus it means a rook is not really sufficient to produce um, a checkmate in this variation if your the opponent's king is running around the center so very interesting very modern and something to keep in mind is that sometimes you might not think much of a square or you know any element in any problem you're dealing with, but actually might have detrimental effects in your thought process if you neglect this piece of information. So the fact that this square is actually linked to another two squares in the chessboard is fundamentally different to just thinking it's another square.
So I hope you enjoyed this session and we'll be moving on to another type of chess shortly. Now another type of chess variant I'd like to talk about here is the so-called fortress chess. Now this type of chess used to be played in the 18th and 19th century in Russia and what's cool about this one is it's played by four players simultaneously. Now we've got two teams, one controlling the white pieces and one controlling the black pieces and the two teams have to cooperate to beat the enemy. Now also we've got each of the players has their own fortress at the edge of the board. So let's have a look at it. Now this is a very interesting version of chess because it involves four players playing simultaneously. Now normally we don't have any aspect of cooperation when it comes to playing chess, but in this version we most certainly do have it. So we've got two white players and two black players and they have to cooperate and beat the enemy team which comprises two players. Now the added element we've got as well is the fortress that each player has to the right and in this fortress we have an extra bishop, knight and rook. So let's add to this by saying that we have a wall separating this fortress from the army that's right next to it. So we've got four bits of wall and we are not really allowed to cross through this wall. Um, and the other thing we have to say is that the knight cannot jump above this wall. So we can't have this knight moving to this square for example. Or here we can't have this knight moving to this square because there is a wall here that we can imagine is high enough for the knight not to be able to jump over. Uh, now there's two variations to this chess variant and um, one is the European one and that is where one of two players of the same color gets checkmated. Their army freezes as such and the team teammate keeps trying to uh, remove the pieces that are checkmating this player in order for the player to come back into the game. Now the Russian variation is slightly more strict when it comes to that and it involves one player uh, losing signifying that the entire team loses immediately. So as soon as one player gets checkmated in the Russian variant, uh, Russian variation that means the team has lost and the opponents have won. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to pretend I am two players and I'm going to be moving this uh, army and this army as well. Whereas my opponent's going to be pretending that she is playing as two different players, moving this army and this army as well. Now, one note I'd like to make here is that during this game, we are not really allowed to verbally communicate with our teammates and describe to them what we wish to do. Therefore, they have to technically guess what it is we are planning to do with the move we've made. And this forms a very uh, interesting aspect of the game because your opponent has to learn to communicate with you through moving the pieces rather than talking to you about it. Um, so yeah, obviously in this version it's going to be a little bit more tricky considering I'm going to pretend I'm playing two different players, but I'm going to be discussing or adding comments about that during the game. Right then, so let's get started. Good luck. Good luck. Okay, I'm going to move both uh, armies as if I were two different people. It's often the case that we mirror each other's movement. Okay, so let's carry on. I don't want to lose any more time and let's get to it. Okay, so so far we're just mirroring we're just mirroring the movements across both armies in each of the two teams. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Let's see. So I will take this bishop here and I will also take this bishop here. Okay, right, let's see now. So let's make way for the king to be able to do something. So I'm gonna move the queen out of the way and I'm gonna move the queen right here. And on this side, I'm going to move the, I'm gonna move this pawn here because I'm thinking I don't like that queen and how it's 
really eyeing down on my territory. In retrospect, I wouldn't really have taken that bishop um, now that I'm thinking that the queen is placed, positioned in a nice position. Okay, so it looks like my opponents mostly moving on that side of the chessboard. Okay, so I was not careless. This is actually a rook. <laughs> yeah. My opponent made a mistake. That's absolutely fine. It happens to anyone with these hand carved pieces, they're a bit confusing. Remember, this is rook. You took my uh, my bishop with that rook, it moved straight. Okay. I thought was careless there for a second. I'm lucky. Um. So let's see. So I'm attacking that rook right there. If I could, if I could just add to the attack somehow. But it looks like I can't really do that at the moment. Maybe I can do it in a bit. Uh, okay. Okay. So what can we do? I'd like to. Ah. So a good idea here for me would be to castle. I've been trying to do that for a while, and then I forgot. Whoops. Sorry. Then I forgot about that. So this player has moved now. He's castled, and now I'm gonna do something similar on that side. I wanna. Near the way, I'm going to move a bishop here, and then that way I can castle because there's no squares taken between my king and rook. Okay, so my opponent over there has castled, but it looks like it might take this player here uh, quite a bit of time to castle because it looks like he's moved a lot of the pieces on the left side, on the king side of the board, which might give me a bit of an edge when it comes to thinking about attacking. So let's see, can we start forming a bit of an attack here? Okay, so let's move this pawn, and then on this side we said I'd like to castle. Okay, looks like we've got about three minutes each left out of five. Okay, bishop, so that bishop is attacking this bishop, and then we've got that queen there. Okay, right. Okay, oh, so I cannot firstly, do this. Why? I cannot play two times the same player. Oh yes, you're absolutely right. You moved the same player twice. So you moved that bishop there, uh, but actually it was this player's turn first. So let's move this back. Basically you have to play this player. And then this player moves. Right then, so it looks like my opponent was a little bit careless now. So I'm going to go ahead and take this pawn, forking the rook and knight here. And then on this side, what would be a good approach? Let's think about it for a minute. So we've got, okay, right, I've got it. Okay, so now notice how this, this rook is under attack. If I take this bishop here, I think it, it's a, generally a good idea to just put more pressure on one of the players that's already under pressure. So now this player's lost the bishop and this army is under attack, so normally what will happen is the two players, if this were my teammate, they would kind of team up against this player right here. They would try to put pressure on him. And obviously the other player uh, using with the black pieces would try to join in and support his teammate. tricky decision for this player because this bishop is actually attacking rook and knight at the same time. Okay, so it looks like the player chose to defend the knight because the knight would be taken and that would be a check for the king, but it looks like now I can just go ahead and take this rook and let's see, is there a way to put even more pressure on this on this player? Let's see, maybe, perhaps, if we... Okay, so this player has already moved, now this player is moving. So, let's see how we're going to put more pressure. I have to be a bit more conscious of time. It looks like I'm a bit short of time. Um, okay, so let's move the queen here and try to get more rooks and other pieces involved and try to attack this side. It looks like this is the now the weak link of the black team. So, the white team would normally put all the pressure on this team. Uh, that player cannot move twice, so it's now this player's turn. Okay, 
So 1 minute 44, 1 minute 25. I think this player's already moved, so it's now this this player. So these pieces, the hand carved. <laughs> Sorry. It's a bit tricky when you're playing two uh, armies at the same time, it's a bit confusing. Okay. Okay, let's see now. Right, so that's looking a little bit dangerous. I wouldn't like to expose the king here, so something to think about in a bit. Now, also we've got on this side, on this side we've got to perhaps put a bit more pressure on the pieces there. And then on this side, let's just make sure that that pawn is not really causing any structural problems. Perhaps if we just move this forward slightly is a good approach. Okay, so we've got about one minute left each. So it looks like we're going to have to speed things up a bit. Okay. Right, okay. Let's go ahead and move the bishop. Oh, what a lovely square for the bishop. Just notice I can take a rook. And then let's move on with the plan of continuing to attack at this side somehow and what we needed for that is to open up the game so maybe maybe bring this rook behind the queen and just try to uh, put pressure with those two pieces at the same time so if i open up the center maybe i'll be able to do that okay so pawn takes now eventually i'll have to take that back and now it's this player's turn right here Again, so it's this this piece is oh. it's not that. So it's this player's turn. Careful. Okay, right. So now it's this player's turn. So first things first, we've got this. Uh, we've got this situation here. We can perhaps take. I've got a better idea. I'm going to bring the bishop back and check here. And at the same time, I'm going to do something on this side, and I'm going to attack this night. Okay, we've got about 20 seconds left each. It's going to be a tricky one, this one. Do you have to think this quickly? Which Does... knight? So this knight is being attacked, this king is being checked, and you have about 13 oh, seconds left. Being attacked? By this pawn. It's actually this, this player's turn. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, ah. it's this player. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like my opponent got slightly confused with the pieces that she had to move. Uh, I mean, it's naturally very, very confusing, and I do appreciate all the support in making this uh, short video and this brief introduction to this uh, chess variant. Obviously, in, under normal conditions, you would only be moving your own army, and it wouldn't be confusing, but now, because you have to pretend you're two different people, uh, it is quite mind-boggling how you have to think about the fact that this player moves first and then this player moves second and it does get a bit confusing about what to save and what to do Priorit prioritizing is key in this variant so a few aspects to talk about here firstly one of the huge benefits that you have with this chess this variant of chess is that you learn to cooperate in a non in, to communicate and cooperate in a non-verbal way because you're not allowed to discuss a plan of action you have to look at each other and realize what it is that your true intentions are and also take advantage of opportunities that arise without really discussing this so you can really form a very strong uh, mental connection with your teammate and you can really build on this connection over time a non-verbal connection which is built purely on the um, the movements on the chessboard and the Basically, the intentions of each player can be um, expressed through the actions. Um, also, what we've got is a huge complexity of what could happen and how two players could cooperate in order to attack and take advantage of the weak um, opponent or a weak part of the army in the game in order to ensure that you win. It also comes into play, um, a, new, a new aspect comes into play when you talk about checking because obviously if your king is under check for example, so here this, this army right now is under check so during the next move for example this player can make any move he likes but this player must make sure that 
the king is not under check. So for example, what could happen in this case, if this player were not really supportive, um, he could, for example, do something like this. Just a completely random move which doesn't help this player at all. And then this player would be forced to move, for example, the king into safety and not being checked anymore. But that means that this knight would eventually be lost in the next move. So instead, what a cooperative uh, team player would have done is instead of making this selfish move, they would have def they would have decided to take this pawn, for example. So they would move the knight, take this pawn. In this case, what will happen is that this player now can move their king out of the way, and now this knight is no longer going to be gone because it's not being attacked. Unfortunately, in this particular case, this knight would go. But this was just a mere example of how cooperation might take place. It might be uh, once sacrifice would take place in order to assist one's teammate. Okay, so let's put this to one side and just quickly wrap it up. So basically, this version of chess is really good for cooperation, communication, thinking about a complicated situation where a lot of different variables come into play and reacting when when all of these uh, variables come into play is a really stimulating challenge and can really make you overcome difficulties uh, when you're faced with similar challenges in everyday life. Okay, so let's have a look at another final chess variant for uh, this lecture. And this is gonna be a combination of, the, of two versions we last saw. Now a really cool version of chess I'd like to introduce here is the so-called Sir Fortress Chess. Now what's really cool about this one is it combines Sir Chess with the historic version of Fortress Chess. So we've got four players playing simultaneously. Each of the players has two queens. There is a hole in the middle of the board, there's teleportation squares and there's fortresses along the edges of the board. What's there not to love? So let's have a look at it in action. So basically here what we've got is each of the players has two queens rather than one. Uh, we've still got the fortress from the fortress chess. We've got walls separating fortresses from the adjacent army. And we've got a gap in the middle and these teleportation squares which work as follows. So from this square you can move in an L shape to any of these two squares. So this one or this one. So we've got this L shape leading to these two squares. For example, this blue square is connected to this one and also to this one in an L shape. So basically in this variant we can't really walk through the center so we'll have to make use of these teleportation squares in order to get to where we want to go. Uh, once again the same rules apply as in Fortress Chess. If one of the players gets checkmated in the European variant, in the European variation then the team teammate keeps trying to rescue their teammate by removing the piece that's checkmating uh, the teammate or in the Russian variation the as soon as one of the players gets checkmated it's game over for the team. Okay so once again we're gonna pretend that I am two different players moving to different armies and my opponent's going to pretend that she's moving to different uh, she's two different players moving to different armies um, and Please remember that normally when we play this with four players, we're not allowed to communicate verbally, so we have to kind of guess what our teammate is up to by looking at what they're doing. Okay, so we'll have five minutes each side, and let's get started. Good luck. Good luck. Okay, so in this case, probably this might be a better move. Trying to control these squares is central in this game, trying to control the blue squares. Okay, let's see, so let's move the other knight here and then move the other knight here. Kind of a four knights opening. to castle. Castling is still permitted as normal. Then I'd have to move these pieces out of the way. So I better start doing that now. So I'll move this pawn with the intention to move my bishop out of the way and I'll do the same thing on this side. Okay, 
so that knight is being attacked so he will have to move in a bit okay so let's start with this side on this side what have we got so this teleportation square i could already make use of it but i think be a better idea to just move the bishop as planned so move the bishop out of the way where should the bishop bishop move here so let's start by moving the bishop to this square and now on this side this knight is under attack so now perhaps it would be a good idea to jump into this square okay so this knight is effectively controlling now this square and this square One thought I've got in mind now is perhaps this knight jumping here to put some pressure on this player and then maybe combine an attack with this player. Right. Okay, so this player's made his move. He's clearly provoking the white player on this side of the board. So is there something worth doing at this stage? Perhaps not. I think it's probably actually controlling this square right here. So I don't want to do anything right here. Instead, I want to go ahead and move as planned in castle. So if I move this pawn forward, then I'll be able to move the queen out of the way to castle. And then on this side, we want to move the bishop out of the way. So what, what would be a good square? Perhaps if the bishop comes... If the bishop comes... Yeah. The idea is that we are challenging this pawn and we're also on the same diagonal we've got the king. Perhaps we can get something out of that in a bit. Okay, so I've got 3 minutes 10 seconds. My opponent has 3 minutes 40 seconds at this stage. And because this is quite a complicated game, we will have to, to rush a little bit to make sure that we have enough moves before we run out of time. Right, so moving the queen forward as planned in order to castle in a bit. And at the same time, we've got this bishop attacking that uh, pawn. So it's going to go ahead and take that. And the bishop is also checking the king of the opponent opposite. Okay, so the bishop is now blocking the check and defending the king. Right, okay, so this player's turn to move now. Now, something interesting here. This bishop cannot really go to many squares. It can either take that bishop or it can just jump to this square or this square. Not doing much at the moment, it seems. So, how would we approach this? Perhaps eventually that play will move the queen will defend and support the, the bishop so maybe if this play castles as planned would be a good idea and then the queen moves forward to defend and support the bishop i've got two minutes 20 seconds left my opponent has about three minutes left so i better start rushing a bit more okay so the queen's out there what is the queen attacking here That's interesting now. So the queen is defending this pawn. So we've got a bit of a cooperation happening here between these two players. Let's see if we can bring some kind of cooperation now between these players to combat that. Oh, I've got an idea. Okay, so how about this player takes this pawn, and then I think it's only natural that then this player goes ahead and takes this bishop and checks that king. So since this king is now under check, the queen can no longer take the bishop because the player must respond to the check to start with. Okay, so the queen is now under attack here. So I'll have to do something with this player eventually. Here the bishop is under attack, something to keep in mind. And now, interestingly, this player is putting more pressure on this army, but this player is now blocking the queen from attacking. 
which is quite interesting. Let's see, so this knight could take this pawn, but then he would be taken by the queen. It's a bit of a tricky one, so instead, what if we just rescue this knight by moving the knight to this square? And now it's also attacking these two squares. And now this queen needs saving, so perhaps just moving this pawn forward does the job. Okay, one minute, 24 seconds on my clock, two minutes on my opponent's clock. I'm mm. clearly losing on time. Okay, so my opponent made a mistake. It's obviously this player that moves first and then the other player. Pawns can no, not really teleport, can't use the teleportation squares. They can only be attacked through them. They can't really attack through them. Okay, right. So what can we do with this pawn that's being attacked here? So this knight can teleport and take this pawn right. Oops, apologies. I can't really move that first. It's this player playing first. So what if this player makes this? Oh, this is going to be a bit tricky. Right, this is going to be a bit tricky. What if this player makes this move and then this knight takes this pawn? Okay, and I've got 50 seconds on my clock and 1 minute 30 seconds approximately for my opponent. players have castled which would make it easier for me to attack them okay so interestingly now this knight is attacking uh, one two pieces but it's also being attacked by that knight so it's we've got a bit of an action taking place here so we've got a bit of action that we have to respond to so then the rook is under attack so the rook's going to move to make sure that he doesn't get taken and now this knight is also under attack so the knight could just jump back or it could also jump somewhere else, but that's not an option. So if the knight just moves, where could it move? So if the knight moves here, it's attacking the rook, so it might be a sensible option, but then this is under attack. Ah, so if the knight moves here, it's defending this piece, and it looks like I've got 15 seconds on the clock. It's quite a tricky one. This one looks like I am running very short of time. Oops. So this player moves second. Yeah. So it's gonna be this player moving first, so now you have to think about, right, okay, so castling is a good idea for my opponent. Now we've got this bishop being taken. Okay, so rook takes from this side and we've also got this king castling. We've got eight seconds on the clock. Okay, queen moved out of harm's way because it was being attacked by the rook. And that pawn moved forward, so we're, oops, sorry, that can't move really. So we can move now uh, this rook and then this knight. And two seconds on the clock looks like I'm going to be gone soon. And now I'm moving, and that's it, it's time. Unfortunately, I didn't manage my time very well, and I've lost. Um, thank you for the game. <laughs> now, a couple of interesting things that came up in this game is how timing really matters. So, for example, when you've got this um, this situation here where this rook, for example, is attacking this rook, something to keep in mind is that the players play first. So, for example, this player will move first and then this player will follow. And similarly on this side, on the white players, on the white team, it's this player who's going to move first and then this player will move second. So, for example, what could happen is, a theoretical scenario, is that this rook could take this rook and then following that we could have, for example, a knight could go to this square. Now, for example, if you were thinking previously that this square is being defended by the rook, uh, it might no longer be the case if this rook made a move first and removed that piece out of the way and then the other piece came into play. So something to keep in mind that a lot of changes could take place in one go, in one move, just because of the uh, the fact that priority really changes things up. Um, so let's move these back and just talk briefly about some other things. So the other aspects of this game involve the complexity of having two players on one side, two players on the other side, 
and the extra queens and the teleportation squares. So we've got a lot of things happening here and it's a really, really stimulating game, especially when you start playing for uh, quite some time. Obviously we didn't have enough time here today to demonstrate all the different aspects of the game. Uh, normally when we try to have a quick game for this version, we tend to say that we will have about 20 minutes each side, which you know, uh, translates to 10 minutes each player. Uh, the time is collective for the two teams, so if one player doesn't really manage the time very well, the team is going to be um, losing in the long run. Um, conclusion is, if you play chess, you can develop some excellent skills in terms of managing your feelings, your emotions, your time, uh, managing relationships with somebody that you you work together with on a common goal. Uh, you don't hold a grudge against your teammate who's mismanaged their time or made a silly mistake, a silly move. We all make mistakes. Uh, we just have to learn to make uh, reparatory uh, movements and basically try to make the most of what we've got in the situation. Um, so if you've got less time just make sure you rush, uh, if you've lost the piece just keep going and cooperation is key. You can't really beat this game if you're being selfish because in the long run you're, if your opponents are two and they're cooperating you're going to lose. Uh, so hopefully this was a, a brief and um, enjoyable introduction to this type of chess and hopefully you can see the potential benefits of exercising your brain in such a stimulating way and all the aspects that come with it. I sincerely hope you enjoyed this session and that after this session you're going to go ahead and play some chess at some point. I would recommend using the website lichess.org or chess.com, these are very popular, or you can use any other website you prefer. You can download an app, play with a family member, a friend, or go down your local chess club and play some chess there when possible. Now, I am confident that if you play enough, you will reap the benefits of playing chess in your everyday life. So, good luck with your chess and life.